what is indeed, again, so good to worship together this resurrection morning. Actually, actually every Sunday is resurrection morning. That's why we worship on Sunday and not Saturday, which was uh, the Sabbath in the Old Testament, is uh, because uh, Jesus rose triumphantly from the grave. So with Christians throughout history, I think it's appropriate for us to say, uh, to pr- uh, for me to proclaim, he is risen, and then I would invite you, together we resoundingly respond, he is risen. Amen. We need to be reminded of that. We serve a risen Savior. And the resurrection, this resurrection morning, as we turn to God's Word, we're going to be turning to the second half of Romans chapter 5. And and specifically, that's verses 12 to 21. And if you'd like to turn there in your Bible, go ahead and follow along. It will also be on the screens behind me. I believe it's in your bulletin as well. And a few days ago on Friday, that's Good Friday, we considered the cross through the lens of the first half of Romans chapter 5. And we saw the message of the cross captured vividly and clearly and concisely with great power in verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And then verses 8 and 9 of the same chapter, Romans 5. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, get this, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So I'm calling this mini-series of messages, focusing on Romans chapter 5, looking at the cross and really the empty tomb as well, the message of the cross, Christ died for the ungodly. And friends, that's us. Christ died for the ungodly. And this morning we're going to see that we are by nature... Sinners needing to be saved. By nature, we need rescue. And considering this will show us why the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is truly the greatest news imaginable. So let's, uh, we're going to jump into God's word together and we'll see the news of sin and death is worse than we can imagine. In this bad news, prepares us for the glory of the resurrection. So think with me for a minute. We'll turn to God's Word in just a second, but think with me for a minute. What happens, what, uh, what comes to mind when your spouse calls to tell you that the car broke down and it's being fixed at the shop? Uh, many of us would probably ask and or at least wonder, think the question, how bad is it? You know, is it minor? Is it... Uh, Something all, not all that big of a deal, perhaps a broken belt, something that is a relatively quick and inexpensive fix, or uh, is it major? Is it something really, really bad? Perhaps the head gasket blew. That's bad news. How bad is it? When we're confronted uh, with a roof leak, we ask the same question. Is it a couple of drips, or is this an indoor version of Niagara Falls? It makes a difference, doesn't it? How bad is it? Is it a few drops, or is it a flood? Or when you hear the news that all of us don't like to hear, but that we hear that a family member is in the emergency room. You know, how bad is it? It's, it of course, it's, it's not an ideal circumstance, but is this uh, something that can be uh, treated and taken care of r- relatively quickly, or is, is this a very serious situation? How bad is it? Is it? And friends, this passage confronts us with just how bad things are. Uh, Verses 12 uh, to 14 of Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world uh, through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For uh, For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from the time of Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. Our universal uh, human condition, uh, apart from Christ, is really incomprehensibly bad. Verse 12 explains how sin and death came to affect us all, saying, uh, saying it this way, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men or all people, because all sinned. 
That's not good news. Verses 18 and 19 continue this theme. The first half of verse 18 puts it this way. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for led to condemnation for all men, or all people would be an appropriate translation. Did you catch that? Universal condemnation. This isn't good news. How bad is it? It's it's bad. And then verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners. Well, we see how bad it is. Now to understand what's in view here, we need to go back Uh, all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible, really to the first three chapters of the Bible, Genesis 1 through 3, and we see quickly that God created everything out of nothing. He spoke, and it was. Let there be light, and there was light. The first words of the Bible, Genesis 1-1, I'm sure many uh, of our our kids who are in Awana are uh, thinking along with me uh, these words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And God created people, that's us, in his image. And placed the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, a perfect place. And he, that's God, gave them just one boundary, one rule. Now I want us to notice here, we have a creator and therefore we're accountable to him. We didn't make ourselves, we have a creator. And he demands and deserves our worship because he's our creator. Well, God gave them this one boundary. Genesis 2.17 puts it this way. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you will surely die. So did you catch the mention of death? Again, we're getting ready to talk about resurrection. But did you catch the mention of death? This is significant. Breaking God's command would assuredly result in death. God said so. Now, many of us know the story. If you don't, I'll summarize it quickly. But Adam and Eve broke God's command, ate the forbidden fruit. Chapter 3 and verse 6 puts it this way. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. So what is sin? Well, let me put it this way. Sin is cosmic treason against our Creator. That puts it in perspective. We have a Creator, and sin is going our own way, turning against our Creator. It's rebellion against our Creator, and get this, it leads to death. And with this background in mind, in Romans 5, verse 12, we see that phrase, sin came into the world through one man. We were just talking about that. In death through sin. What did God say? In the day you eat, you will die. In death through sin, and so death spread to all men. So that moment back in Genesis 3, sin came in, and it spread, and it multiplied, and it affected everything. Damaging everything. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says the same thing as Romans 5.12 in slightly different words. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Did you catch those words? For as in Adam all die. This tells us how sin and death came to to universally plague humanity. Theologians use a, a fancy term. They say original sin when talking about this. We don't start our lives off neutral or innocent. We start off as sinners. And at no point in our lives was there the possibility of not sinning. We sin because we are by very nature sinners. And this concept of original sin is taught throughout the Bible. Actually, one of the things we see if we look at the first chapters of the Bible is that after Genesis 3, things slid downhill very quickly. And then in Genesis 6 through 8, we end up with a worldwide flood. And you say, God washed the world clean. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because actually, he saved Noah and his family, but, and, and everyone else perished in the flood. But then in Genesis 8.21, we're talking about right after the flood, we see that sin is not gone, but it is still present. This is, again, Genesis 8.21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, they're making an offering, 
The Lord said in his heart, I will never curse the ground, be, I will never curse the ground because of men, man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Never again will I strike down every living creature as I have done. So God's making a promise. He's making a covenant with Noah. But did you catch that? For the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. That's after the flood. Or Psalm 51.5, poetically, Psalm 51 is written uh, as David's psalm of confession after he sinned, greatly committing adultery and murder. But Psalm 51.5, this is what David has to say in confession. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. They say, this is hard. Parents and grandparents, think back to when you were children. Think about your children and your grandchildren. Do kids have to be taught to lie? No. We must be taught to tell the truth. Is sharing something that comes naturally to us? No. Mine! <laughs> and don't, don't be hard on your kids. Think back to your own childhood and you go, yep, that's right. <laughs> we can see it. Now, unsurprisingly, this can be a bit unsettling and hard to swallow, at least at first. And there have been disputes about this doctrine throughout history, but it's essential to get it right. But once we accept the reality of original sin, it explains the world around us and the depravity, the evil that is bound up in our own hearts. Our own hearts are war zones. And if we're honest with it, with ourselves, we know that to be true. This is indeed hard to accept, but once we accept it, it makes perfect sense of the brokenness of the world around us and of the inner selfishness that resides within our own hearts. Have you ever found yourself tempted in some way and you are horrified? I won't ask for a show of hands, I, but I'm sure it's universally true. If you have a conscience at all, that's true. You've been tempted to sin and you find yourself horrified. Why do I even think that? And you, you ask yourself, where did that come from? We're talking about that. Where did it come from? We're talking about that right now. Why are there brutal wars? Why are words like racism and genocide and murder and all these things even in our vocabulary? We're talking about that. Original sin explains our issue. And the only answer is peace with God. We need the one who is himself the Prince of Peace. So back to that question, how bad is it? It's really bad. Most of us would be willing to admit that we've sinned. Romans 3.23 says it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isaiah 53 says, we all like sheep have gone astray, turned everyone to his own way. But this goes a step farther, telling us that the reality of sin has without exception brought physical and spiritual death to all people. We were singing about that. I was, isn't, what, didn't we sing a line, I was breathing but not alive? I was breathing, but I'm spiritual, I was spiritually dead. Either that was true in the past, if I know the Lord Jesus Christ, or it's true of me today, if I don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think with me, I'm convinced our sinful nature, and again, I, I'll get to good news, but I just we ha to see the glory of the good news, we have to see how much we need rescue. So think with me. I'm convinced, uh, I was thinking about this and studying this this week, but I'm convinced our sinful nature runs deeper and is more entrenched than we're even able to comprehend. Well, what I'm saying is we're worse than we think we are. Pride and selfishness are entrenched in each of us, each and every one of us in ways uh, more... In, in, more, in, in bigger and more, more ways than we even know how to wrap our mind around or even know how to understand. So you might have given the council cheer up. Things could be worse. Well, let me put it this way. We're worse than we think we are. We're also more loved than we can fathom. But we're worse than we think we are. We're more sinful than we can comprehend. And with that in mind, we must consider 
and gaze on and ponder and be captured by the depth of God's love, the depth of his love for us. We're more deeply loved than we can wrap our minds around. And again, you know, for God so loved the world, now all of a sudden that's starting to take some much more full and multicolor meaning, right? When we realize, whoa, for God so loved the world, that, that's me. Wow. And because of all of this, physical and spiritual death stand as the universal and common enemies of humanity. And rolling our eyes through verses 13 and 14 of Romans chapter 5, we see that Adam, whose name in Hebrew means the man, broke God's command. Of course he did. But death still reigned from the time of Adam to Moses. And the law wasn't given until Moses. Think God's people coming up out of Egypt and then going to Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law, of course, but receiving the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. But between the time of Adam and Moses, the law had not yet been given. So you couldn't sin by breaking the law because the law didn't, hadn't yet been given. But long before God's law was given, there was sin and death reigned. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. We're by nature sinful. And with this background, let's reflect on the glory of the resurrection of Jesus. When we ask and honestly answer the question, how bad is it, the glory of the empty tomb and of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is rightly magnified. The message of the cross and of the empty tomb is that Jesus Christ has triumphed over sin death and death. And we need his victory over sin and death. Oh, how we need his victory. Apart from Christ, we're by default spiritually dead and awaiting the universal fate of physical death. That's miserable and discouraging news. But the news of the resurrection is that we don't have to stay in this miserable pit. There's a solution. There is one who stood in our place and has triumphed. The Lord Jesus Christ is triumphant over sin, death, and the devil. And we're gazing on his victory as we gaze on his victorious resurrection. In Jesus, we can be freed from the fear of death. And that's both physical and spiritual death. He's the answer to these universal enemies. In Jesus, forgiveness of our sins and eternal life are freely offered. I want to read verses 15 to 21. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the, um, by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. For if the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the, abundant, the abundance of grace in the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, by one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. But the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Adam comes death and condemnation. Through Christ comes justification and eternal life. The glorious message of justification and the certain hope of eternal life are because of Jesus' substitutionary death standing in our place and his victorious resurrection. They are because of the cross and of the empty tomb. And as we continue to see a comparison between Adam and Christ... Notice that the progression of thought is an argument from lesser to greater. An argument from Adam to Christ. A comparison and contrast. Whereas Adam brought universal ruin, 
in Christ, blessing is freely offered to all and secured for all who will ever believe. God's grace in Christ is infinitely greater for good than Adam's sin is for evil. Let's follow this comparison through the passage. Adam brought death, and I'd point out that that's both physical and spiritual death. Eternal, that's eternal separation from God. That's verse 15. Adam brought judgment and condemnation from God himself. You say, why are we condemned? Because of our sin, because we've turned our back on our creator. That's what sin is. It's cosmic treason. So verse 16, judgment and condemnation from God himself. And through Adam, death reigned, according to verse 17. And again, that's physical and spiritual death. Verse 18 tells us, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Through Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners, according to verse 19. But praise God. Praise God, friends. That's not the end of the story. God's free gift is unlike Adam's trespass, according to verse 15. The free gift has overflowed to or abounded for many. God's gift brings justification in verse 16. Through the free gift, all who believe, that's all who receive the Lord Jesus Christ, will reign in life as opposed to death. That's verse 17. One righteous act leads to justification and life for all men, for all who believe. That's verse 18. Through Christ's obedience, the many will be made righteous. That's verse 19. And also in verse 19, eternal life has been made available through Christ for all who believe. And remember the universality, the universality of physical and spiritual death. And now we're told eternal life for all who believe. Now, I should pause and make sure we understand the word justification. It's a legal term that describes what happens the moment we place our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone to save us. Stated from a negative viewpoint, we are declared not guilty. Stated from a positive viewpoint, we are declared righteous before God. Christ's perfect righteousness is credited, or theologians say it is imperfect, imputed to us. Justification describes being made right in God's sight. Theologian Wayne Grudem describes justification this way, an instantaneous legal act of God in which he, one, thinks of our sins as forgiven in Christ's righteousness belonging to us, and two, declares us to be righteous in his sight. We are declared not guilty. We are declared by God to be righteous in His sight. And it's all because of the cross. Remember how the chapter began. If you roll your eyes up to verse 1 of Romans 5, you see, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then also in verse 9, Therefore, since we have been justified by His blood. Where was His blood shed? Well, on the cross. We have been justified by His blood much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. With this glorious comparison and contrast in mind, I'd call our attention uh, to a few points at the end of this passage. Listen to verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Did you catch those words, the many? These words actually echo Isaiah 53, which are words of a, the prophet Isaiah coming between uh, seven and 800 years before Christ came, talking about the servant of the Lord looking forward to Jesus, justifying many. And then Jesus took those words on his lips in Mark chapter 10 and verse 45 as he was preparing his disciples and telling them about what was about to happen, that they're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going uh, to be you know, uh, crucified, and, and three days later he will rise. But they didn't understand this beforehand. Um, of course, afterwards they could look back. But then Jesus said this, following that prediction of his suffering and death, he says this, for even the Son of Man, he's talking about himself, came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Did you catch that? A ransom for many. 
These words take us to the cross, to the death and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus. Without Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross where he shed his blood, paying the just penalty for our sins as our substitute, we'd be forever condemned. We're talking about what has been well termed the substitutionary atonement. Jesus faced what he and he alone did not deserve so that we do not have to face what we do deserve for our sins. And then the chapter concludes in verses 20 and 21 speaking about God's law. And this idea echoes some words that come earlier in Romans, Romans 3.20, for by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law shows us our sin. And at times, because of our sinful nature, the, not, the law actually awakens sinful desires in us. You say, what do you mean? Think of a keep out sign. Have you ever seen a sign that says keep out? And what desire rises in your heart? We won't ask for a time of confession, but you know what I'm getting at? <laughs> what desire rises in your heart when you see a keep out sign? Gee, I wonder what's behind that sign, right? Or, you know, and, and the law has a way of doing that. Sometimes when we're told no, we find the impulse to disobey rising within us. The law condemns because when we look at God's law, we see how serious our sin problem is. Remember how bad is it? And sometimes when you're lost, you think, oh, I'm only a little bit lost, right? You ever been in that situation? I'm only a little bit lost. I, I'll get it figured out real quickly. Guys, you know, we're, I see some guys grimacing, you know. I mean, like, we know what it's like. You know, we don't, I don't need to ask for directions. We'll figure this out. But then somebody offers a map or maybe the GPS, and then you realize how bad it really is, <laughs> okay? It's not just a little lost. It, it's really bad. Well, God's law does that for us. Actually, many years ago when I was in college uh, in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, I ran across a group of hikers, and uh, they were, as I was driving by, they were jumping up and down, waving, and it looked like they had some kind of emergency. And let me tell you, when you're on, you know, very lonely roads and someone is, you know, very far from any kind of civilization, they're trying to flag you down, you better stop to help because there might be some kind of emergency. And this was before cell phones were a thing, too. So, you know, it really, it really needed to stop. And as I stopped, I pulled over and went, what do you need? You know, and can you just take us back to the lake? It's right up that way. I said, it's not that way. And it took me about 10 minutes to convince them I had to go get a map. I said, do you know what you've done? Well, they'd walk through the woods. They were exhausted. They never would have made it back. They probably would have collapsed. And they'd walk through the woods, and they were literally like 30 miles by road, 10 miles by walking from where they thought they were, and there was no way they'd make it back. But the map showed you're not just a little lost. You're really lost. Well, God's law does that to us too. You know, when we read God's standards, when we read the Ten Commandments, when we read God's commands, we don't think, well, I'm just a little, you know, maybe a little off base. You know, no, no, it's not too bad. No, we, we look at it and go, oh, no. Oh, no. I'm lost and I need a Savior. So God's law does a good job of showing us our need for showing us, uh, you know, how, how sinful we really are. But we can't obey. We can't, we can't succeed. We're not good enough because we're sinners. So the law condemns us and shows us our need for redemption. We are by nature sinners needing to be saved. And verse 21 concludes with these words, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you catch those words, eternal life? No better topic to talk about on a resurrection morning. Eternal life. Jesus is the only solution to the sin and death problem that we share. Praise God for Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, is the solution. Jesus, in Jesus, the gift of eternal life is freely offered. Now, I'd like to attempt to put all of this together, taking a closer look at verse 17. And verse 17 says this, For if... Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Much more will those who receive, that's a key word, you might want to circle that, receive the abundance of grace of the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Friends, everyone must choose Adam or Christ. All of us 
are confronted with a choice. The questions sh- stare us in the, fa- in the face. What am I doing with God's gift? Have I received God's free gift? Or am I continuing on autopilot following the default path of least resistance? There's nothing more important than your answer to these questions. Because if you're continuing on default, the passage tells us that uh, that for all of us, the natural human condition is walking in the way of Adam. The natural default human condition is the way of sin and death. And it's the cry of my heart this resurrection morning that all of us can truthfully say. Can truthfully celebrate the glorious truth that Jesus is the solution. Jesus Christ is triumphant over sin and death on the basis of his resurrec- and on the basis of his resurrection we look forward to our resurrection. Certain hope, eternal life, death is not the end. Jesus has secured eternal life for all who will receive his gift. So all of us again need to ask ourselves personally where do I fit into all of this? Am I standing with Adam or with Christ? Death or life? What am I actively choosing? Am I a Christian? A committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Praise God. I know that many, many of us this morning can honestly proclaim yes. And it's my prayer that all that we've gazed on refreshes us and calls us to worship when we consider what we've been saved from. The truths of justification, eternal life, and peace with God should move us to thanksgiving. May we never lose sight of the depth and breadth of God's love. May we always reflect on what Christ has done for us with childlike wonder. Maybe you say, I'm not yet a Christian. I'm not yet personally a committed follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You could turn your life over to the Savior right now. Pray, talk to the Lord Jesus. And tell Him that you're a sinner and ask Him to save you. Tell Him that you're placing your faith, your trust, your belief in Him and Him alone to save you. Tell Him that you're surrendering your life to Him. Romans 6.23 summarizes bad news and then good news this way. For the wages of sin is death. We've talked about that. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can accept His gift this morning. Perhaps this morning you need to pray words like this in the quietness of your heart. And if these words that I'm about to repeat reflect the cry of your heart to make a first-time commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, then just repeat these along with me. Or say something like this in your own words. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you have risen from the dead. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I want you to be my Savior and to come into my life at this moment. As best as I know how, I turn my life over to your care and control. Amen. Maybe you're saying, I hear what you're talking about, but I'm not ready to take that step. And make that commitment. At the very least, commit yourself to a serious search for the truth. Commit yourself to investigate. Grab a Bible. Open to the second part. That's the New Testament. Turn to the Gospels. Those are biographies all about Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'd suggest Mark. It's the shortest. Read Mark and read about Jesus. Investigate. But don't walk out this morning shrugging your shoulders because this is a matter of eternal consequence. We need the Savior. And if in these moments you've prayed and made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ today, something like the words that I, that, that I suggested, do this. Before you leave, tell somebody. Don't walk out the doors without sharing this good news. 
that has a way of, of cementing that truth in our hearts as we proclaim, this is, this is where I am. This is what I've done. Friends, praise God for the cross and the empty tomb, for the death and resurrection of our Savior, for his atoning sacrifice and victorious resurrection. Because of the cross and the empty tomb, peace with God is available instead of war with him. Eternal life instead of eternal death. Friends, all who are in Christ are citizens of heaven instead of hell bound. Dearly loved children of God instead of condemned enemies and justly facing his wrath. Oh, sometimes pondering those truths causes me to tremble. The only fitting response to the grace of God is a life of worship, a life that declares his praise. Let's pray. Lord, in these moments, through the power of your Holy Spirit, do in us what needs to be done. We're in different paces, Lord, and we want to meet with you where we're at. If today needs to be the day where it's a first-time commitment to follow you, we pray that that would happen. For those of us that are your followers and that have come to that place of surrendering to you, Lord, may today be a, a fresh reminder of the gospel a fresh reminder of our need for you. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that we pray. Amen.